So we know from chapters 3 and 4, but specifically tra chapter 3 in terms of truth definitions, uh, how we developed the rules in chapter 6 for negation, conjunction, and disjunction. Specifically, we saw the derivation rules that allow us to move from uh, one or more premises to a conclusion so that we have a set of strategies and tactics for deriving the conclusion of a valid argument. And we also saw in chapter 6 how when a sentence is a tautology uh, or more broadly is a logical truth, we can use our rules and we can use uh, related concepts to get uh, to, to derive that necessarily true sentence. So in chapter 7, we saw two more connectives uh, out of which, uh, sorry, we saw two more connectives that are effectively built out of our existing uh, Boolean connectives. Um, and what's nice about these connectives, namely the conditional and the biconditional, and one of the uh, advantages of the connectives, conditional and biconditional, um, in terms of adding them to our system is that uh, they reflect some common ways we have of uh, thinking and uh, using language. Now in keeping with our theme of talking about our derivation rules in terms of truth definitions, uh, let's move on to the derivation rules for the conditional and the biconditional We'll also uh, talk about uh, these rules uh, in terms of strategic approaches to derivations. So really quickly, uh, here is a review of the truth table for the conditional. Recall that the material conditional, that is the interpretation of the conditional as effectively mapping on to the concept of validity, is such that the conditional is false in one and only one case, that is when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. How, does, how is that a, a, a reflection of mapping the concept of validity onto the conditional? Well, recall that there is one way in which an argument is invalid, and that is when the premise or premises is true and the conclusion is false. Hence, here, row two. The other rows uh, reflect the other ways in which uh, you can uh, have uh, combinations of true and false premises and conclusions, um, or all true premises and a true conclusion, and, and still have a valid argument. All right, so let's uh, first take a look at what the rule, uh, how the rule appears. On the left, or sorry, on the right side of the slide, you see the rule form. It says conditional intro, and then you see uh, two vertical lines. The first vertical line is the uh, line, uh, the main line of the sequence you're in. It could actually be the main spine of the derivation. It could be a subproof. It doesn't matter, but it's the it's the main line insofar as where you're headed or your goal is a conditional claim. So you see at the bottom of that vertical line the sentence P arrow Q. Now the indented vertical line is the uh, assumptive sequence. And one of the nice things about the conditional uh, intro sequence is that uh, the proof is a version of what the conditional claim says. Right? So remember, the conditional claim reads in ordinary language, if P, then Q. Look at the vertical. The assumptive step P is an if. Right? Assume I have P, or if I have P, then when I prove Q, it follows that if I have P, I have Q. So from the assumption that I have P, I derive Q, which allows me to then assert, therefore, if I have P, I have Q. We'll talk about strategies in just a little bit, but that's what the rule looks like. 
um, when you uh, uh, make the assumption of the antecedent and you derive the consequent of a conditional claim that you wish to prove, uh, you will use the uh, conditional intro rule. Now let's look at the left side of the uh, uh, slide here. Um, I've used the example A arrow C. Really doesn't matter what the antecedent is, what the consequent is. You assume the antecedent, you derive the consequent, you get out of that subproof. Now conditional elimination is a rule uh, that should look familiar to you in a number of, of ways. And what I mean by that is this, you've seen it um, in informal uh, proofs for, or sorry, um, uh, informal inferences for quite some time. It's uh, known as affirming the antecedent. Uh, it's also known uh, by its uh, uh, Latin modus ponens. And uh, when you have a conditional claim and the antecedent is affirmed, the consequent follows. So you can say something like, uh, if I have 10 pennies, then I have 10 cents. I do have 10 pennies, so I have 10 cents. Um, and if you go back to the discussion of the conditional in Chapter 7, you'll recall that the conditional claim, in terms of the ordinary ways we have of thinking about it, is such that that antecedent is said to be or is, is uh, uh, believed to be by the person who's using it um, a sufficient condition or uh, it guarantees the antecedent or sorry it guarantees the consequent so the antecedent is thought to be a sufficient condition the antecedent is thought to guarantee the consequent so when we say if p then q we're saying that on the assumption that P obtains, Q also obtains. So that when P does obtain, Q follows. Now let's take a look at the uh, biconditional. And the biconditional symbol is a shorthand for uh, truth functional equivalence. So you'll notice that lines two and three of the truth table uh, reflect what happens when the P and the Q sentences do not have equivalent truth values. That is, when P is true and Q is false, or when P is false and Q is true, the biconditional is false. So go back to chapter four and the notion of the concept of tautological equivalence. You'll recall that two sentences are tautologically equivalent uh, when they have identical values in the column under the connective that governs the sentence. So on each row of the truth table in the column under uh, the connective that governs the relevant sentence, you'll see that the values there are equivalent to or the same as the values of uh, the sentence to which it's being compared. So the biconditional symbol says, look, P is truth functionally equivalent to Q. So when P is true and Q is true, the biconditional is true. When P is false and Q is false, the biconditional is false. Remember uh, a longer way, right? So just to, to hash out a little bit more uh, what I said just a moment ago, um, a longer way of asserting this equivalence is in terms of the following sets of equivalences. So notice, hold on, I'm going to draw this. Notice that we're talking about the biconditional and then we're talking about these two sentences. I know my writing is terrible but I'm not good at using the uh, PowerPoint pen. That's attractive. Anyway, uh, notice that we're talking about two sentences. Um, so, so the biconditional and then here's a sentence and then here's a sentence, right? So we're separating them out by the vertical lines. Okay, so the biconditional says uh, in longer terms, I have both or I have neither. It also says, again, in longer terms, if I have one, then I have the other, and if I have the other, then I have the one. Think about Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Tweedledee are together. 
right? So when you have Tweedledee, you have Tweedledum. When you have Tweedledum, you have Tweedledee. You see both Tweedledum and Tweedledee, or you see neither of them. They go together. Notice, again, here's our biconditional symbol. Here's both or neither. And here's if one, then the other, and if the other, then the one. Uh, this last example is a way of talking about P being a sufficient and necessary condition for Q. Now let's look at the rule. So think about the biconditional intro as a, uh, a two-time conditional intro. When you have a biconditional symbol and you derive first one side by the assumption from sorry from the assumption of the other and then you immediately turn around and assume the other side of the biconditional and derive the first from it you can say that when you have p you have q and vice versa so uh, if it helps you you can think about the biconditional uh, intro rule as uh, uh, working the conditional intro twice. Um, you can think about it as looking somewhat like the disjunctional elimination rule insofar as the biconditional intro rule involves a successive subproof sequence. Two subproofs on the same line. That is, they are uh, not indented one within the other. They're both indented in the same, on the same tab, if you will. And then uh, lastly, the conditional elimination is a two-way uh, elimination. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, let's go back real quick. Remember the uh, second of the two sentences that are truth functionally equivalent to the biconditional. Uh, we have P as a sufficient and a necessary condition for Q and vice versa. So we know that we can dismantle the conjunction such that we end up with P arrow Q on one line we can also end up with Q arrow P on one line. Uh, as long as we have P by way of conditional elimination, we have Q. And then once we have Q, again, by, condi by conditional elimination, we have P. The converse also applies. So remember, the affirmation of the antecedent brings down the consequent so that when you have a two-way conditional and you have one side, you will have the other and vice versa. So conditional elimination is uh, a two-way uh, conditional elimination. Okay, so we'll talk more about proof strategies. Uh, but here it is now in summary fashion. When you want to derive a conditional claim, you will set up conditional intro. When you want to derive a biconditional, you will set up biconditional intro. So think of now uh, your conditional intro and your biconditional intro as two more strategic rules in your strategy arsenal. You have in order of uh, what we learned, the disjunction elimination strategy, the negation in intro strategy, and now the conditional intro strategy and the biconditional intro strategy. You're going to want to work backward, in other words. That's what these strategies uh, allow us to do in a sort of panoramic way when we see that we want a conditional, when we see that we want a biconditional, we say, okay, I am going to now work my way from what I want uh, to what I want by way of a strategic subproof. It's like a template or a roadmap to get you to where you want to go.